So just a quick reminder here that, uh, you know, Elon has been posting quite regularly here, you know, that he keeps reminding us. This is just, I've already reported this. He did this just a couple of days ago over the weekend. He said, as I've pr said previously, unsupervised full self-driving Teslas will be carrying passengers in Austin in June and many cities in America by end of year. This will enable passenger cars to increase in utility by roughly half an order of magnitude overnight with a software update. Um, now, curious, by the way, that he said this part at uh, the same, like the paragraph after this one, like he's kind of implying here that in June, that's overnight. And that's not the case, right? Because passenger cars, that won't happen until the following year when you can actually put your car into the, to the network. Although he thinks that if you can show that a Model Y can all of a sudden do this, Maybe that's what he's saying. Once people realize that, all of a sudden your you, your car will go up. Uh, Farzad said this by now, if you don't believe Tesla will achieve unsupervised level four self-driving, you're simply ignoring the inevitable. The real separation isn't Tesla achieving a level four. It's the fact that Tesla can manufacture two to three million cars per year that are uh, less than 30,000 per unit cost, cost of goods. And uh, Elon said, exactly. We could have done a neighborhood by neighborhood handcrafted solution with high resolution maps, expensive sensors, LiDAR, they could have done that much sooner. That doesn't scale and gets destroyed by real world AI and cameras. So he's basically reiterating that point. Okay, so I just wanted to remind folks that that's what Elon said a couple of days ago, but now we keep getting these videos coming from China. You got Ray talking about this Huawei ADS. It missed to switch to the correct lane at a fork. And so the driver had to manually correct it then it failed to turn left under an overpass to follow the planned route. FSD completed the exact same route without any issue. Uh, let's watch uh, what this looks like. So he missed that one. This is FSD doing it just fine. Yes, yeah, so I think round two. he, at the well, last the second, did he intervene on he the did, first yeah. one? Yeah. Yes. He had to manually take over that first one for the Huawei system, but Tesla, no problem. This is the Huawei system, and it's supposed to turn left, and it doesn't. And then this is uh, FSD doing just fine. Yeah, it's so, great to see these tests. And while, I mean, this situation is anecdotal, we, yeah. you know, we don't want to read too, too much into this story by story thing. When you look at all the stories that are coming out, it does yeah. start to paint a picture uh, that is very positive. But I think one of my big takeaways from all of this is I've reflected on it is to go back to a theme that I know that you and I have touched on a number of times over the past couple of years. And that is just thinking about the significance of Tesla releasing free trials of FSD and what that says about their confidence in the software and the level of maturity that the software has. And I have been looking for a long time for those signals where Tesla is willing to give away FSD for a month and just let people try it because to me that tells me that, hey, they are very confident that it's safe because they don't want to just give it out as a free trial when they feel like they're at risk of it getting into an accident. And it seems like while that kind of underlying logic makes sense that even though they gave out those free trials, the the user experience wasn't good enough here in the United States in the past yeah. to draw a whole lot of people to go ahead and subscribe. But over the last year, the progress of the software has been great. And I think maybe the next round of free trials here in the US mm. could actually see much better adoption. But all of that to be said, the fact that they're willing to roll out a free trial, not in the US, but in China, which has dramatically more uh, variations in crazy driving scenarios. And they have, you know, it's their second largest market. They have the second largest number of Teslas there. And so not only are they willing to roll it out and just let the chips fall where they may, let all of these people do all of these tests. And, and none of these people are experienced FSD testers. Like this is an entirely new market. It's not like here in the United States where mm -hmm. there are a lot of people who have been driving FSD for a long time when they do this, uh, that they have the ability to kind of build slowly into their confidence that this is gonna go okay. 
they were able to just roll that out overnight by surprise to the entire country, basically. Um, that in and of itself implies a level of confidence and software maturity and the ability to handle those 99.9999 March of nine edge cases um, that is exceptional. Now, does that mean we're ready to roll out Robotaxi as a service in China tomorrow? No, probably not. But it definitely tells me that the foundation is laid to where we can get there very quickly once they have the ability to really collect all of the data at scale from actual usage of the system, uh, not just from their human drivers that are riding around and collecting data while they drive. Yeah, in this show, in the, in the future, in the next segments we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about two top Tesla, sorry, Chinese auto executives talking about uh, partnership with Tesla for maybe Alibaba for cloud and another one that actually sells intelligent systems saying how great Tesla is. So the comment about FSD being offered uh, as a one month free trial, Tesla did, China did do that, uh, but then they had to pause for a second uh, for a few days because of this paperwork that needed to be filed. They did file that paperwork, reported on yesterday that it's back on again, this one month free trial. That's a fantastic signal that it's going really, really well. And the reason I wanted to compare the Huawei one was because if you remember about a month ago, there was big hoo-ha. Everybody saw this incredible viral video that went viral in YouTube. Out of, I think it's out of spec who they showed that this guy from China took the Huawei system and he drove it full self-driving. And he said, this is the best out there. And everybody started realizing, oh my God, Huawei's are true, uh, better than Tesla. Tesla then releases their FSD. And now you're seeing side-by-side -side comparisons. And it's turning out that Huawei actually is only available for a small group of cars. It's only their premium cars, small, tiny number. FSD is available for all these uh whoever bought every FSC single yeah every single car millions, is available for it yeah two and a half million cars in china can do it if they decide to do it. Mm -hmm. now that they gave the one month free trial as you said it's like mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people are testing it out and it's looking great well so and think this, about the implications of that for just a second on what the requirements are for huawei i'm not saying that this is 100 percent what's happening but it does open the possibility that if you're only opening this up for a few thousand cars that are yeah. on the roads, you yeah. absolutely can have one-to-one -one or two-to-one human supervision for yeah. every single one of those cars yeah. that you have Ex on the road. Yeah. And, and you might do that just to gather your data. That doesn't necessarily mean that the quality of that software is mature enough to be able to reach scale. And it, like scale matters. Uh, one of the things that I said yesterday is that thinking about Waymo versus Tesla's full self-driving capabilities is almost like thinking about the yeah, software so capabilities that. of a mainframe versus a PC. Like yeah. if you can do something on a PC that you could do on a mainframe, well, obviously the one that you can do on the PC is going to reach way more people way faster. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a much more profitable product overall than if your only customers are mainframe customers. And the same is going to be true for Tesla's FSD system versus all these other people's systems that use way more complicated sensor suites. They haven't fully matured the software to be end-to-end -end neural networks. And so it's this patchwork of human written code that has weird edge cases that just don't mesh well. And then like it works fine most of the time until that one critical situation where it doesn't. And that one critical situation where it doesn't is the hardest thing to solve in autonomous vehicles. And it's the place where I, th you know, that's why Waymo is so constrained in where they are willing to drive their vehicles and what weather conditions they're willing to drive their vehicles and whether or not they're willing to go on freeways at highway speeds and all of these things is because they don't want to expose themselves to that level of risk. And Tesla has taken a completely different approach and they have exposed themselves to all of those scenarios and they are you know, falling back on having the human driver be the last line of defense for those safety critical disengagements. 
uh, but that has allowed them to gather data and mm -hmm. develop an end-to-end -end neural net solution to this problem that can and will scale. So Huawei is a Huawei avatar. That's the card that you can have to use. It says the uh, overall ADS is a good system, but it doesn't live up to the buzz that it's a top intelligent driving system in China and even better than FSD as Huawei fans claim. There's no need to hype ADS. And that's because they didn't know what FSD could do. And they just thought, oh, my God, we're so much better than FSD. It turns out that they're not. So that we saw that one video. Uh, another Chinese influencer, Andy Lee, wrote this blog post. He shared his insights into the realities of Chinese intelligent driving solutions and is critical of their capabilities being overly exaggerated. To be fair, some of the issues of Chinese systems he describes are reminiscent of FSD early builds like version 10 and 11 from what I can see. Here's the translation. So this is what he actually wrote, said, what consumers want is actually very simple. Do I want to use it or not? You, that's what you just said, isn't it? That's the only standard, right? Do I want to use it or not? If the steering wheel wobbles and the car sways, sure, you technically don't need to take over, but do you dare to use it? The moment that happens, the user immediately switches to manual driving, curses idiot, and just drives themselves. Um, when encountering a parked vehicle, it doesn't go around, but just waits foolishly, then slowly signals and changes lanes. Sure, no takeovers needed, but tell me, would you be frustrated if you're waiting there for so long? At an intersection with no traffic light, it doesn't slow down, but just charges through recklessly, looks bold and efficient, but in reality, it's just plain stupid. Meanwhile, the driver is freaking out inside. Like it doesn't matter, there's, you know, there's no traffic light, but you want to slow down just in case. There are so many issues like this, I could list the whole bunch, and none of these can be measured by some nonsense takeover rate. Isn't that great? It's like, I like that he's actually listed this out. Real tech and capability are becoming more important than ever. The moment a user turns on intelligent driving, they immediately know if it's good or not. Does it feel safe? Is it reassuring? Is it actually usable? This is his blog post that he wrote. And here's a clip of Andy Lee testing out full self-driving. He talked about similar features and called the other self-driving systems uh, dumbass. Sometimes I like to play to listen to his uh, intonation, but let's remove his voice and you can see what he actually said. So this is Tesla's full self-driving. There's a car on the right. A car on the right's coming. It saw it ahead of time, slowed down. Very good, really good. Um, at this spot, some autonomous driving systems just charge straight ahead. Dumb. Dumbass. <laughs> yeah, I really like his specific focus on the intelligence of the yeah. system because that is really what it boils down to. And, and not only the intelligence, but the ability for the system to make you feel like it knows how to drive like a human would. Not just a human, but a good human driver would. And while, you know, I would say that FSD is the best in class at that specifically, it still does have a little ways to go um, that it seems like over the last year, it has gone from being maybe a, a 14 or 15 year old driver who needs mm -hmm. constant interventions um, to maybe an 18 or 19 year old driver who's timid, you know, too aggressive in some situations, not aggressive enough in other situations. Um, but at least you can get the sense like, okay, now this, like, this is someone who's actually going to be able to drive well, like they just need more experience. And you can't get that feeling uh, with any other approach than a full end-to-end -end neural network, because a full end-to-end -end neural network is mm -hmm. the only thing that has the ability to incorporate all of the different factors that humans use to make decisions on how they're going to drive in a way that is seamless. When you try to do that with the way that all software up to neural nets worked, where you know some programmer has to think of what is every different scenario that could happen. Okay, and now I'm going to write specific rules. If this, then this. If mm -hmm. this, then this. If this, then this. And then you have this super, super complicated set of rules that in theory, they were great until you put them in practice and you find out, oh, in this one weird situation that was a mm -hmm. combination of two different scenarios that I didn't mm -hmm. ever imagine happening at the same time, these rules 
conflict and they produce very strange, very non-human behaviors. And that's the kind of thing that neural nets just cut right through that because they're not if then else statements put together in a giant patchwork of rules. It is, I have seen this situation a hundred times and I know exactly what to do in this situation. Or it is, this looks like in between this situation over here that I've seen mm -hmm. and this situation mm -hmm. over here that I've seen, and I'm gonna make a decision on how to proceed that's a combination of those two things. And it's just a completely different approach to how you solve this problem in software. And it's the only, like this is, this is the way that our brains work. And this is the only software approach that solves the problem like our brains do. And it is focus that says, you know, intelligence, like, you know, if it's smart, Elon has been saying this for a long time, that <clears throat> like the core problem of self-driving is an intelligence problem. You have to solve baby AGI. You have baby to yep. do this in intelligence. And if you think that your sensors and handwritten human code are going to get you there, you're going down a dead end because they can't. They're just not, sensors are not intelligent in and of themselves and human handwritten code is not intelligent either. And that is the reality of the situation that most of the other companies that are pursuing this problem have run into over and over before and will continue to run into until they adopt full end-to-end -end neural network approaches using the most minimalistic suite of software or uh, sensors that they can.